Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we're just grateful for children here today. Your children are grateful, thankful for the grace that you have poured out. Truly, it is amazing grace. Every day, just amazing how good you are to us, how patient you are. And uh, Lord, and, and knowing that you're, you're, you're a just, the, the just, true, living God. And, and yet, Lord, your son Jesus has, has taken the full, the full brunt of, of your wrath, O oh God, against all evil in this world. He's taken it upon himself and, and satisfied all the requirements that, that, that the debt, the sin debt that belongs to us, all, all that it would require, he has absorbed upon himself. Your word says that he knew no sin, became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Lord, we just call it, wow. But Lord, we thank you today. We praise you. Lord, we do that you will help us today as we journey down the road of life. Do so in, in a way that, that brings glory and honor to you, O oh God. And Lord, that means blessing for us and will bless other people through us. And that's the outcome of it all. And then one day, we land in heaven. So Lord, we praise you. We give you thanks now. Lord, as we open your, uh, open your word, we pray that once again, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts. So that you can. This we ask now in that name that's above every other name. Lord, pray and ask it now in the name of Jesus. All right, please join me in your Bible's book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, and uh, I want to speak to you this morning as we continue uh, thinking together about keeping it between the ditches. Now listen, as you go down the road of life, there are many ways in which the road of life is paved with financial decisions and financial discipline or the lack thereof. Now, along the way on the road of, of your financial life, you, uh, you're going to find some potholes along the way. Now, you hadn't been down this road before, and so you don't know where the potholes are. So you come upon them, and, and they're there, and you're going to hit some of these potholes. And goodness sakes, uh, many of us uh, lived through the Great Recession of 2007, 8, and 9. And as one man said one day to me, he said, my 401k has now become a 201k. <laughs> and th this is literally the truth. People lost, and, and me included, uh, in the market. Of course, he gained it all back now, but, but uh, just kind of like half of your retirement uh, savings just disappeared there in that 18-month period of time. And uh, anyway, so but, but I'm just saying that these, these potholes in are out there and and in the road of life but ain't your potholes you won't see them coming and you won't now that said there are two ditches okay keeping it between the ditches right but there are two ditches here two financial ditches and one of those financial ditches is uh it's less dangerous than the other one but one of those financial ditches is is the lack the lack of money. Now, what the lack of money does is the lack of money simply deters you. It slows you down. It keeps you from doing some things you'd like to do and you believe you should do and you want to do and all of this. Okay? Let me just give you a quick example out of my own life. I, I wanted to go to, to the Holy Land. And as, as a preacher, goodness sakes, preacher needs to get to the Holy Land as early in his ministry as he possibly can. But I, mean, I wanted to go, but I didn't think I could afford it. Okay? It's kind of expensive. still kind of expensive. But, but anyway, and, and I thought, well, I can't afford it. Well, I finally got there when I was 60 and to, to the Holy Land. And I, I'm telling you, I was there about 48 hours, and I'm thinking, dumb old me. I should have sacrificed something along the way to have made this trip. You see, they come over here and to, to the Holy Land, Israel and surrounding area. But, but anyway, and that's, that's the tip. Things get deterred. The lack of money will deter you. Okay? That's one ditch. You won't stay out of the ditch for lack of money for all possible. Okay? 
And I'm sure all of you could amen that. I'm not asking for an amen, but I'm just saying, you know, lack of money, you don't want to go in that ditch. The other ditch, though, is far more dangerous. It is the love of money, okay? You got to stay out of that ditch, the love of money. Why? Because it will destroy you. Not just financially, but it'll destroy everything. It'll destroy your life, your family, your dreams, your goals, your aspirations. Friend, the love of money keeps you from going to heaven itself. This is the truth of it. So you got to stay out of these two ditches and keep making progress down the road of life. So I'm talking to you today about this whole matter of God blessing your finances. Okay, now, our text this morning, I'm giving you two verses, and they apply really to everything we're going to say today, but it's Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, so why don't you stand your feet now and reverence the reading of God's Word, Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Let me say this before I turn you off with this. My concern today with you is this, as we think together about this whole matter of God's plan for your financial blessing, okay, is that this is not about what God wants from you, it's about what God wants for you, okay, you're one of his children, as parents, we don't want, as parents, we don't want something from our children, do we, we want something for our children, y'all with me, okay, and uh, Lord Jesus said, if you be evil, give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more, how much more will your father help you give that which is good to them that ask you? Okay? So listen. And what I'm going to do is we take, well, let's read the text. Okay. Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. Okay? Now, this is an agricultural society to which this is written. So it's, it, it's produce. But you can think of this you know, of all you produce. You're with me? Okay? As, as opposed to produce, as opposed to rabbits and lettuce and, you know, and sheep and goats, well, you know, like that, okay? So honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all you produce or your produce and your vats and your, excuse me, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 And amen. You may be seated. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the simplest thing you have ever heard. And you're going to be able to remember this, hopefully, when you walk out of this place today. But I prepared this message for my congregation in 1993. Do the math, that's 27 years ago. I've been preaching it ever since, everywhere I go. I mean, revival meetings and everything. I take a revival meeting everywhere I go. And preach this message right here that I'm preaching to you today. Okay? Why? Because you need it. Why? Because Jesus said you cannot love God now. You're going to make a choice. Okay? One way or the other. You're going to love money and material things. Or you're going to love the true and living God. But you're not going to do both. Okay? And so this, this is critical. It's critical to you moving down the road of life in a way that honors God and results in your blessing and those two run right together, okay? And so, but I'm going to give you, uh, take, if you take your hand, four fingers, a thumb, okay? I'm going to take these four, these, these flanges you have right here and I'm going to give you a name for each one of them and tie to each one a timeless biblical, timeless, simple, biblical principle, okay? Five principles. You take these and apply them in your life, and I can promise you, you are on the road to God's blessing on your life in the area of your finances. Now, so let's kick this thing off. We're going to start out with a pinky finger. Okay? So y'all all hold your pinky finger up in there. Okay? You got your pinky finger. Now, what, what, which finger is this finger? What's it called? Say it together with me. No, you're not doing good enough. Come on now. Say it together with me. Pinky. All right, there we go. It's a pinky finger. Okay? Now, the pinky finger stands for plan. What does it stand for? Plan. plan. 
Hanky Finger stands for plan. And here's the statement for it. Here's the principle that God has planned for your financial blessing. I hope this is not a disappointment to you to hear this. I hope it's not a disappointment to you to hear that God has planned for your financial blessing. But he has. He has. This is planned for you, your financial blessing. Now, there are three reasons why, three biblical reasons why God desires to bless you financially and will do so unless you just keep him from doing it. Okay? And one of those reasons is so that you can provide for your family. The Bible says over in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, that he who provides not for his own, especially those in his own household, is no better than an infidel. God wants you to be better than an infidel. Help, okay? And, and so he blesses you financially so that you can provide for your family. Does this make sense? Okay? Now, and then there's another reason, okay? And that's so that you can give. You can give. Now, the Bible says over, and we found this many times in the Scripture, but one that stands out to me is in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And uh, the Scripture says there that God causes you to abound in all things, in every way, so that you have a sufficiency unto, a financial sufficiency unto every good work, okay? He wants you to be able to give to his kingdom's work. And so he blesses you financially so that you can give to his kingdom's work. Now listen, suppose you had it in your heart to give $10 million, you just put it in your will, for instance, $10 million to the international uh, for our Southern Baptist International Mission Board. What a worthy thing to do, to give money. But beloved, if you don't have $10 million, it can't happen. We making sense here? Okay? And it takes money to support global missions along with everything else that God's doing on this earth today. Okay? But he prospers you and blesses you financially so that you can provide for your family, so that you can give up every good work. And then... He blesses you and prospers you financially so that you can enjoy good things. Again, I hope this isn't a disappointment to you. Listen, who do you think God made diamonds for? He didn't make them for the devil's crowd. And they end up with some of them anyway. Okay? But he made, he made all this good stuff for his children to enjoy. Okay? One of my favorite verses. Psalm 84 and 11. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Folks, listen. You walk uprightly with the Lord, and you can live with expectation. No good thing will he withhold, okay, from them that walk uprightly. Now, so having said this now, pinky, by, by the way, pinky is for what? Plan. Pinky is for plan. God has planned. God has planned for your financial blessing. Now, and just as a little bit of an aside, not only has God planned for your financial blessing, but you need a plan. You need a plan for your financial blessing. I'm just tying this in there, right there, while I'm in plan, while we're doing pinky, okay? But listen, you need, you need a plan for your financial blessing. And that plan that you have for your, you and your family's financial blessing, it is called a budget. A budget. Now listen, if you stay married long enough, you can probably after about 30, 35, 40 years, and I think Diane and I probably hit that point about 30, uh, probably 35 years, well, we really didn't need a budget anymore. I mean, the, the spending, the earning, spending, saving, giving, uh, investing patterns and habits of our lives, they were so ingrained in us, we, it just all happened. I mean, it just all happened. So if you stay married long enough, you can probably live beyond me but budget. But if you've been married less than 30 years, by the way, there were many times she and I went ahead and wrote out budget and lived by a written budget, even after that, just so we could be a good example for the folks who went back. Okay, so I can tell them, we do this, okay? Which, you know, it's a good thing. But, uh, 
But anyway, you, you need a budget, okay? And without a budget, you don't have a plan. Without a plan, oh my goodness, it's like you set out on a trip. The wife turns around and says, well, where are we going, honey, anyway? And you say, well, I don't know. I don't know, we're just driving down the road. Who knows where you're going to end up, right? Well, financially, you need to know where you're going. And you need to know how you plan on getting there. And so, this is what I'm about to talk about. Now, quick recommendation on the budget. I recommend to folks, never had a reason to do anything different than this, okay, recommend to folks that you use what's called the 10, 10, and 80 plan. If you're not familiar with the 10, 10, and 80 plan, many of you are. First 10% of your income you give to God. Second, second 10% of your income you give to yourself. In the form, and that is, it becomes savings or investing, investments for you, okay? So 10% to God, 10% to yourself. The other 80%, uh, that is for you to live on. Now, keeping in mind that all your taxes and insurance and all that kind of stuff needs to come out of that 80%. It's a good idea if you take your if you take your gross pay and you look at it and you cut it in half. Let's suppose you earn twenty dollars an hour. So then you need to think, okay, what we're going to need to live on is ten dollars an hour. If you live on that ten dollars an hour, you won't have any problem at all. Okay, and you can build an emergency fund and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, so anyway, enough of that. Now that's painting. Pinky stands for plan. plan. Okay, Pinky stands for plan. Now, the next next uh, finger that we want to seize on is this middle finger right here. Middle finger. Say middle finger. Middle finger. And it stands for manager. What does it stand for? Manager. Middle finger stands for manager. And here, and listen, here it is. God owns it. Here's the principle. God owns it. I manage it. God owns it, I manage it. Say it with me. God, I, simple as that. This, listen, God owns it, I manage it. Well, listen, beloved friend, you came into this world with nothing. You're going to go out of this world with nothing. And God, God owns it all. He's always owned it all. And he always will own it all. Okay? Now, the Bible tells us this over in Psalm chapter 24, verse 1. Earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and all they that dwell therein. He owns everything. He owns everybody, period. Okay? Over in Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Okay? And on and on you can go through the Word of God. We've got a passage over there in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. It talks about God owning everything in heaven and on the face of this earth. Now, God owns it. So God owns it, and what you do is you manage it. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, that it's required of a steward or a manager. That's what a steward is. It's got one of those old-fashioned words. Okay? But a steward, uh, it means manager, is required of a steward or a manager that a man be found faithful or trustworthy. Now what a trustworthy or faithful manager does is with whatever it is they're managing, they do with it as the owner wishes for them to do with it. And if they do anything else with it other than what the owner desires for them to do with it, then they are unfaithful and they are untrustworthy. Now all of us want to, all of us want to get to heaven one day and hear the Lord say to us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, beloved friend, listen, if you are not recognizing God's ownership of everything in your life, I'm talking about your spouse, your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, every dime and every account, the house you live in, automobiles you drive. By the way, it's kind of refreshing when your automobile breaks down. You go to the Lord and say, Lord, your automobile broke down. <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing. It's kind of a fun thing, you know. And you say, Lord, what are we going to do now? You know? Well, listen, God cares about the details. He says he numbers the hairs in head, right? He cares about the details in your life. That's what I'm saying. And to recognize, you know, listen, you won't make God smile. You, you, just, you just recognize day in and day out. It's just kind of like you go along in life. God's ownership. God's ownership. 
you know? And it's so refreshing, you know, when you when you have brothers and sisters in Jesus that, that you're, you know, you, they bless you in some way and, and you're, you're thanking them profusely like you do and all of that, you know? And they say, it all belongs to the Lord anyway. You know, and it does. Why would you not live that way? It all belongs to God. So God owns it. And, and what you do is you manage it. And you want to be a faithful, trustworthy manager. And do with it that which God would have for you to do with it. So anyway, so middle finger is for manager. Middle finger is for manager. All right, let's move on from there. What about this one? First finger. Say first finger. First finger. First finger is for, this is study, okay? First finger is for first, first, okay? First finger is for first. And, and here's the principle. Put God first in everything, and he will add everything else to you. Put God first in everything, and he'll add everything else to you. But this is what the scripture says. Go over in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Lord Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let me just pause right there. If you'll take that and personalize it, it's the Lordship of Christ. Seek first the Lordship of Christ in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll add everything else to you. And in context, if you read that passage in context, he's talking about food and clothes and that kind of stuff. Okay? And so, my goodness, I mean, he's talking about things that you're going to have to spend money to, to, to provide or, or take care of. Or, anyway, but he says he'll add all this stuff to you. My goodness, just put God first in everything. And, and, and what does he do? He just adds everything else to you. When you think of God putting you putting are you putting God first in everything? What kind of things are we talking about? How about relationships? Uh, particularly those of you that uh, are, you know, you're 18 or under, or, or uh, maybe you're single, but, but at this time, uh, single adults at this time, let's think about boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. Look, put God first. First. Put him first in these relationships. Put God first in your career first, in your marriage first, in your health. Look, take care of your body. I know I've hounded you about this before. Gee, take care of your body. Your body's the temple of the living God. Okay, it's where God lives. You take care of it. Put him first in your health, in your hobbies. I mean, in your hobbies and sports. Put God first. You need to, you need to ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do in relationship with this? Huh? This hobby or the sport that I enjoy, enjoy. Look, I don't have time to illustrate all this stuff, but but it's like hobbies and sports and putting God first. I passed a friend that that uh, he he told me one time. He says I've got two days off a week and I fish both of them. And I mean he fished. We're talking about from dark till till four o'clock in the afternoon. And then he cleaned fish when he got home. Okay, and and with what I'm doing that, he's playing golf. And you know what? After a few years, uh, goodness, he'd been married 20 years probably. In fact, his wife just left. Wife just left. Why? She didn't have a husband. That's why. She's pastoring the church, fully absorbed with pastoring the church, five plus days a week, and he's fishing or playing golf all the rest of the time. I mean, you know, you need to put God first. What am I to put his spouse first? It's about coming to the Lord and say, Lord, what would you have me do? You see. And so. Anyway, first in your budget, first in your buying, put God first in your saving, and first in your investing, first in your calendar, first in your schedule, first in your friendships. Listen, you need to give the first dime in every dollar. Put God first. First day in every week, the Lord's Day. The first day in every week. Give it to God. Put him first, okay? And the first desire in every decision you make, the first desire is to please the Lord, to honor the Lord. Isn't that where our text started? Okay? Honor the Lord. So we want to put him, we want to honor the Lord. The first desire in every decision is to honor the Lord, okay? And on and on and on. First in your vacations, first in everything. Just look. Just put God first in your mind. 
and, and he'll add everything else to it. So here we have Pinky finger is for plan, okay? Middle finger is for manager. The first finger is for first, okay? You're going to say first give God his righteousness. God will add everything else to you. Okay, so, and then the T is for tag, okay? The T is for tag, the thumb, okay? The thumb is the T, and it's for tag, okay? The, the thumb is for tag. And here's, here is the principle. The tithe is the tenth, the first tenth, okay? But the tithe is the tenth, and that tenth is the test, okay? That tenth is the test. Now, uh, I asked Mr. Debbie to put Malachi 3.10 on the board. I've just been quoting these verses to you, but, but anyway, Malachi 3.10, it says, bring the whole tithe, the whole tithe, in the storehouse so that there may be meat or food in my house and test me now in this says the Lord of hosts if I not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows listen God says to you you want, this is the only place in the Word of God in which God gives you permission, much less encouragement, to put him to the test. But he says, test me now. You, listen, you need, if you consider yourself a believer in the Lord Jesus, you have hope of heaven one day, you're hoping that he's going to keep every promise you ever made, you might well find out now what or not he is. You know how you find out now? You just tithe in. I'm serious. This is what you do. You tithe in, God. You take that first tenth and you bring it to God. And you do so because it belongs to God. You see? The Bible says over there in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, that the tithe is the Lord's. The tithe is holy unto the Lord. It means it's set apart to him. It belongs to him. So you're not giving your tithe to the Lord, okay? You're giving his tithe. You're returning his tithe to him. But he said, test me in this. Test me. Now, here's a test that I want to uh, I want to challenge you with. And now, listen, let me tell you this. I could run a stream of folks, and I, I don't have any idea. In fact, I've never, I've, I've always said this to congregation, our pastor, I don't, I don't want to know who gives what. Okay? Never have known, I don't want to know. Why? Because if, if, you, if I knew, you know, if I knew you weren't tithing and you were, you know, saying, well, church ought to be doing that. The church ought to be doing that. And I'm sitting there thinking, you stinking hypocrite. You know, I just don't want to know that. Y'all with me? I, I, I'm kind of like, dude, you're not trusting God. You're just yapping. Okay, you're just talking. Well, we need to have more walkie walkie and less talkie talkie, right? And that walkie walkie, that walkie walkie, yeah, that walkie walkie is, is, listen, take God, he said, test me now in this, you might well find out whether or not he's going to keep his place. Listen, how do you know when you close your eyes in death that you will open your eyes in heaven? How do you know that? Well, here's the deal God said, put me in chest. Test me now in this. And so what do you do? Test him. Here's the test I suggest to you. That you, if you're not tithing, that you start tithing. And tithe, start tithing now. Okay? You don't, you know, this is kind of like you just jump in. Okay? And, and you start tithing now and tithe for six months. Seriously. But here's what's going to happen. You will never quit tithing. You know, if you'll tithe for six months, you'll never quit tithing. And the reason why is because you, know, you have positioned yourself under the window of heaven where the blessings are poor, of God are poured out on your life. And listen, the Beatles had it right in one respect anyway. Money came by love. <laughs> listen, the stuff that you need most in life, you can't, listen, you can't buy it at Walmart, doesn't matter how much money you have. Amen. You can't get on Amazon and buy it, order it up, have it delivered to your house. The 
the stuff that you really need. But you see, it's all that stuff that money can't buy, that you need the most. God can pour it out on you. And as I started out telling you, he's planned for your financial blessing. You're not going to have less because you're tired. You're going to have more because you're tired. Okay? You're going to make, listen, the same discipline that you're using to set that time part to the Lord first, that same discipline, first thing you know, it's permeating all the rest of your decisions. You see, it's permeating your spending decisions, your savings decisions, all this stuff. You see? And, and listen to me. God's, oh goodness sakes, God's way works. Okay? In fact, the big idea for the day is that God's way works. Okay? God's way for your finances, it just works. And you're looking at a satisfied customer right here. Okay? You, just, you know, I start saving, uh, I start, saving start tithing, saved all my life, but, but start tithing when I got saved. And uh, my goodness, how God is just blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed, blessed. Well, listen, don't just take my word for all this. Some of you, if you're not read Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life, you ought to get a hold of a copy of it and read it. And you'd probably just pull it up online, read the whole thing. I don't know. But anyway, here's what he says in this book. And when, when Kay and I got married 28 years ago, we decided that if anybody got paid in our marriage, it was going to be God. We may be in debt to other people, but we're not going to be in debt to God. So for 28 years, every time we made some money in the first part, went, the first part of that went back to God. There were sometimes it was really tough. There were times when I was out of work. There was times when we had no income. When I started this church 23 years ago, I had no salary. There was no support for this thing all about the church. Yet I write. My tithe check thinking, I don't know where it's going to come from and I don't know where it's going to go. I would say to you, now having been a Christian for 40 years, God is faithful. God will take care of your needs. He's not promised to take care of your greeds. He has promised to take care of all your needs. In 40 years, I've watched God bail me out time and again. And I put him first in this area of my life. I challenge you to do the same. I know some of you say, Rick, I'd like to. I just can't afford to. I will say you cannot afford not to. You want God's blessing in your life? One of the best known businessmen in Orange County told me one day, you tell people the best time to start tithing is when they're in debt. If you want God's help to get out of debt, you put him first. Beloved friend, listen. This is God's way. And the same thing about it, just like your thumb, touches all your other, touches the full fingers, right? And makes them operative. They cannot achieve what they've been designed by God to achieve these other four fingers without the thumb, you see? And it's the tie that touches all these other four principles, okay? And I challenge you to, uh, hey, tie six months. If you're not, if you're not tied yet, tie, tie six months, you'll never quit. But, uh, but you will have tested God to very least. One, one other passing just thought before I get out of this, and that is this. Not only does God say to you to test him, God uses the tithe to test you. Listen now. God uses the tithe. He owns it. He put it under your care, under your mantle, under your stewardship. God uses the tithe to test you. Now, I'm going to story of Abraham. What did God tell Abraham? The Bible says God tested Abraham. And he told Abraham, he said, Abraham, you take what I have given you, that child according to promise, Isaac, you take him up the mountain and you sacrifice him to me. You give him back to me. That was the test. And God doesn't ask us to do that. Now, Abraham passed the test, of course. Okay? He's going to go up there and do what God told him to do. Give back to God that which God had given unto him. He was going to do what God told him to do. He passed the test. But of course, he didn't end up happy that God had already provided a realm in the thickets. You see, which is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. He'd already provided, you see. But God is testing you as well in the time.
because he has given you all of it. He's given you 100%, and he says to you, to give back unto me this tithe which I've set apart for myself. You give it back unto me. That's the test. God's tested you. It's not just a matter of him saying, test me now in this. He's tested you as well. Okay? So whether or not you're going to be that faithful steward. Now, so we have the pinky stands for plan. plan. Okay, middle, stand, middle finger stands for manager. Right, manager. First finger stands for first. Okay, put God first. You know, had everything else to you. Okay. The thumb stands for tie. And the ring finger. The ring finger obviously stands for relationship. Okay? Now listen, it's all about your relationship with God. Okay? Money's not about dollars and cents. It's about your relationship with God. And, and he said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's all about your relationship with God. And, you know, our Lord Jesus gave us 38 recorded parables. 16 of those 38 parables are concerned with money. Why? Why? 16 out of 38 parables concerned with money. Why? Because it's that important. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In addition to that, Found five times more is said about our Lord Jesus Christ about money than about prayer. Why? Is prayer not important? Beloved friend, listen. You will serve God or man. One of the God or material things. God or money. You're going to serve one or the other. It's that important. In your relationship with God. More said about money by our Lord Jesus Christ than he said about heaven and hell combined. Think about this. That's why I'm talking with you about it today. Because let me tell you something. I'm not being a faithful steward of the responsibility God has given me as a preacher of the gospel and as your in on pastor if I don't talk with you about this matter right here, right now, today. It's all about your relationship. Now listen, Diana and I have been married 53 years. There was a day in my life when I was scared to fit this. And that day was three days after my 18th birthday when I stood in front of Pastor Calvin Hazelwood. And Diane, 17 years old, stood there with me. And we took marriage vows that day. We made promises and commitments to one another. I loved her and I believed in her. And she loved me and she believed in me. I believe that I was going to keep those promises I was making that day and commitments. I didn't know if I'd keep them or not. But I intended to. I planned on it. And I believed that she was going to keep those commitments that she was making to me. I didn't know if she would or not. But I, I believe she would. And we made those commitments, those promises to one another. Listen, in your relationship with God, don't you think about this. In your relationship with God, you have connected with Him in, in, in an eternal way. God has trusted you. He is trusting you. He believes in you. Say, that sounds strange. Well, no, think about it. God has put His kingdom's work into your hands. He has no backup plan. He gave us his kingdom's work on this earth okay, to carry out. He's not going to send angels to do it. He's not going to send somebody else to do it. He's given it to us. He's get those of us who have placed our faith and trust in him. Okay? He's put his kingdom's work in our hands. He believes in us and trusts in us in that fashion. Okay? Likewise, we believe in him and we trust in him. We give him our lives. Has he given us his life? Yes, in the person of his son. He has laid down his life for us. Do you see this? This is a relationship that we have with God. This living, 
personal, it's dynamic, it's transformational, and listen, you need to understand that ring finger is for relationship and this, this whole matter of money and material possessions, it's all about your relationship with God. Now listen, if you've not yet entered into a personal, life-changing relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, by turning to the Lord, and by just saying to Him, Lord God, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, and Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only Savior sent from heaven. And I'm coming to give you my life today. If you've not done that, then do that very thing. Let's get the deal done. Get it done. Make that commitment of your life to God and start following Him from this day forward. And listen, if you've not yet linked your life up with a local body of believers, maybe just come, maybe you're a believer in Christ, you just come float around right now. Well, and quick folk, okay? You need to get your, your life anchored to a local fellowship and get to know these people, to love them and be loved by them. Listen, the church is the local family of God. And you can come today. Join fellowship with this church. And believe in Christ. Come today. To give your life to Christ. And be saved today. Let's bow together. Father God, we come to you now in Jesus' name. Lord, we do pray. That we'll just obey you. That we'll listen to your voice and say yes. Yes, Lord. Listen to you and answer yes to you. And then act. And fashion is consistent with what you're impressing upon our hearts. During this time of invitation today, we praise you. We praise you, Lord, for what you're going to be doing in our life and the lives of us. This way, it's down in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand your feet. You're singing while we come to come now.